The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Philippians, in the third chapter and the seventh verse. The seventh verse in the third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. But uh, what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. We come for the third time to a study of this third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. And I would again explain as to our reason for calling your attention to this particular chapter. The apostle here is dealing with the most vital and urgent question for every single one of us and for everybody in the world at this very moment. And that is, what exactly does it mean to be a Christian? And how does one become a Christian? I say this is the most urgent and the most important question for us to face. I say that because I'm just repeating what the Apostle says. In writing to these people, he says, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. He's concerned about them. Here were people who'd become Christians, but certain teachers had come round and were threatening to come round, as they did many other churches, and they were confusing people as to what it really means to be a Christian. The apostle says, well, I've got to write to you about it again, because I can't have, take any risks in this matter. For you it is safe. He means this, that a man's welfare in this world and in the world to come through all eternity depends upon this one thing that is the claim of the Christian message, that this is God's way of salvation and that it's the only one. Christianity is an intolerant religion. It claims that it and it alone is right that it and it alone is God's message. Now, that is the claim of the Christian message. This is God's way. It's the only way. So the apostle says, we can't afford to be in any doubt about this. For you it is safe. And if that was true in his day and generation, well, how much more so today? They hadn't got atomic bombs then. Of course, they'd got to die then as every other time. But uh, life has become unusually precarious in our day and generation. And that is why I'm calling attention to this very question. The only way to be safe in a world like this is to see your way through death, is to see your way into eternity. And this alone can enable us to do it. I'm not here to think or to suggest to you that... Uh, Anything I can propose can put an end to the bombs and the war? No, no, that's not my business. Nobody can do that. This is a world of wars and rumors of wars. What we've got to consider is what happens to us if these things are used, or even if they're not used. How do we go out of this world? Where do we go? What can we do about it? Well, now that's the message. Now then, we consider the first Sunday night to the definition of a Christian, verse 3. We are the circumcision, this is Christianity, who worship God after or by the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That's Christianity. That's what it means to be a Christian. Secondly, we considered last Sunday night how one becomes a Christian. We did it in the light of the Apostle's own experience. He puts it in verse 12. He says, I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. He tells us that he who had not been a Christian became a Christian as the result of the Lord Jesus Christ arresting him on the road to Damascus. He was off on his way, following his own will, verily thinking with himself. Suddenly a hand took hold of him, gripped him, turned him round, arrested by Christ. That's the only way to become a Christian. No man can ever make himself a Christian. 
We've got to be taken hold of by God. We've got to be taken hold of by the Holy Spirit. We've got to be arrested, apprehended, laid hold of, grasped. We work that out together. Now then, what are we doing tonight in terms of this seventh verse? Well now, here we are beginning to consider what happens to a man when he has been arrested in that way, when he becomes a Christian. And of course, in looking at this, we shall at the same time be uh, presented with another test that we can apply to ourselves to know whether we are Christians or not. I say again, forgive me for repeating it, that to me this itinerate, as far as my work is concerned, is the most urgent thing. To me there's nothing more terrible than that a man should think he's a Christian and find at the end that he's not. I know of nothing more terrible than that. Very well, in looking at one of these first consequences of a man becoming a Christian, we shall, I say again, be enabled to test ourselves and prove ourselves and examine ourselves in order to make quite sure of it. This alone is the safe thing for us to do. Very well, what is it that does happen when a man becomes a Christian? Here's one of the answers. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. What's he mean? Well, what he says is this, that when a man becomes a Christian, he undergoes a complete revolution. There is a complete transformation. Or if you prefer it in the language of that 17th verse of that chapter we read at the beginning, he becomes a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's what happens to a man when he becomes a Christian. Turned right about, turned inside out. Revolution, everything different. Transformation, call it what you like. How does this show itself? Well, he says it shows itself immediately in this way. That a man now finds that he's got an entirely new point of view. He's got a new attitude to everything, but especially to the most important and vital things in connection with our life in this world. That's what happens. What things were gained to me, them I counted loss for Christ. You see the revolution. He's looking at the same things as he'd been looking at before, but he sees them in an entirely new light, in an entirely different manner. His opinion about them is absolutely reversed. He's in the exact opposite position from that in which he was before. That's what happens when a man becomes a Christian. Now, this is absolutely basic to the New Testament teaching. A Christian's not a man who's just a little bit different from what he was before. He's not a man who's just a little bit different from other people. He is absolutely different. Regeneration, rebirth, new start, new beginning, altogether different. That's the case of the New Testament, isn't mine? The apostle is teaching it here about himself. He teaches it everywhere else. This is the truth. He's got, I say, an entirely new view of everything. Now, this is expounded by the Apostle not only in this verse, but in the immediately following verses. What is it then that a man discovers? Let's put it like that. He's undergone this great change. Everything's different. Well, what does he find? Well, what he finds is this. He finds that he's been all wrong. But in particular, what he finds is this that he's been deceiving and fooling himself. That's what he finds. Here it is with this man, you see. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's what he used to think about himself. What do you think now? That he was an utter fool. He realizes that he's been deceiving himself the whole of his life. Fooling himself. 
That's what a man finds and feels when he becomes a Christian. Not that he's been fooling and deceiving other people. He's been doing that incidentally. But the thing that gets him down and smashes him finally is this. That he's been fooling and deceiving himself. Now then, that's the thing that the apostle puts before us. How does a man discover that he's thus deceiving and fooling himself? Well, his answer is this. He begins to count. What things were gained to me, those I immediately counted. He began to count, lost for Christ. Now he's so concerned about this that he repeats it again in verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them, third time, but down, that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, etc. Now you notice that he uses that word count three times. That's what makes a man discover that he's been deceiving and fooling himself. He begins to count. What's to count? Well, to count means really what it, what it says. It means that you begin to think. It means, if you prefer it, that you begin to make an assessment. Or if you still prefer it. It means that you begin to conduct an audit. You begin to examine the books. You've been running the business of life. You'd kept your ledgers. You'd kept your books. You thought everything was all right. Now, you really now begin to make an audit. And you begin to count. That's what is meant by this word, to count. A man begins to examine his book of life. He begins to examine his whole position. And as the result of this examination, this audit, he just discovers, I say, that he's all wrong and that he's been the whole time living in a fool's paradise. He has been deceiving, misleading, fooling himself. Now then, that is the matter as the apostle puts it before us. Let me hold it therefore before you this evening in the terms of some three propositions. Here is the first. The non-Christian the man who's not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a man who always makes a false audit and always produces a false balance sheet. That's the first thing the apostle tells us. What things were gained to me. You see, there's the annual report. Profit and loss account. Everything was all right. He wasn't in the red. Everything was all right. Profit, gain. Balance sheet, audit. Yes, but uh, you see, in the light of what he tells us, the principle he's teaching is this, that the non-Christian, the unbeliever, always makes a false audit and produces, therefore, a false balance sheet. Now we must look into this. We must examine this. Why is this? Well, the first reason is this. The sinner, this unbeliever, he doesn't really count. He doesn't really face the facts. That's what it comes to. He thinks he does. The apostle thought he did. But what he's really saying here is this, that it was only after he met the Lord on the road to Damascus that he truly began to count and to examine the situation. He hadn't done so before. He really hadn't faced the facts. Now, this is the case that the Bible makes everywhere from beginning to end. Against all those who don't believe in God. Against all those who are not Christian. The Bible's got quite a lot to say about a man who doesn't believe in God and who doesn't live the godly life. It says that he's a rebel. It says that he's missing a mark. It says that he comes short of, falls short of a given goal. It, it says he's a transgressor. It's got many things like that that it says about him. But I think that of all the charges that the Bible brings against the man who isn't a believer in God and who doesn't live a godly life, is this, that he's a fool. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The fool. That's its ultimate verdict about a man who doesn't believe this message and who doesn't have a life based upon God. He's a fool. But of course he doesn't know that. 
the apostle, as I say, was guilty of self-deception. He found that he'd been fooling himself. It's exactly the same still. All people who are not Christians are in this position. Of course, as I say, they don't realize that what they think is this, that they alone are wise. Why are people not Christian? Go and ask them. They'll tell you. Oh, they say, of course, we read. We don't just go on carrying on a tradition. They say they've got brains, they've got intellect, they've got understanding, they reason, they know about science and so on. They're all cases that they're not Christians because of this knowledge and reason and understanding. And what do they think of those of us who are Christians? Well, of course, we are just emotionalists. And we believe in some sort of sob stuff. Christianity, the dope of the people, the opiate of the masses. Christianity, what is it? Well, it's just an avoidance of life, they say. You just go on indulging in your fairy tales and singing your hymns and choruses and persuading yourselves that all is well. The trouble with you people is, they say, you believe this sob stuff still. You're just sure emotionless. When are you going to grow up? When are you going to start thinking? When are you going to be men? When are you going to use your brains? When are you going to make it, take advantage of modern knowledge? When are you going to leave all oh, this? That's all right in the past, but now. Isn't that the argument? But according to the apostle here, and as according to the whole book, you see, the position is the exact opposite. The whole, of the, appeal, the whole appeal of the Bible is an appeal to reason. What's the first great note in the preaching of the gospel? Well, we can answer that quite simply. Go to the beginning of the gospels and look at the first preacher that appears in the, in the account. Who is he? Well, he is John the Baptist. That's the first preacher that you come across in the New Testament. A strange man, this. What did he preach about? Well, we are told that he preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He called upon people to repent. But what is to repent? And the word itself tells us. Repent means think again. That's what it means. The call to repentance, which is the first call in the gospel, is a call to men to think again. Don't go on as you are. Stop. Think. People came listening to him. The Pharisees and scribes came. And John looked at them and said, Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Repent, he says, think again, examine your whole position. No, that's typical of the Bible. It's a book that always calls upon us to stop and think. Now, let me put it like this quite simply. Let's contrast what we are doing here at this very minute with what the average man in the world is doing at this moment. And I mean by that a man who may be an intellect, a man with brains and understanding. What are people doing tonight who ridicule us for doing what we are doing? They do it in the name of thinking and reason and knowledge and understanding. They regard us as emotionalists. But now let me put this to you. Do you think that they're thinking as strenuously as you are at this moment? As you're looking at your westerns. Does that call for intellectual thought and reason and contemplation of life and all the other things they look at and the drinks come round? Is that stimulus to thought? Is that reason? Going through your Sunday newspapers and all the lurid cases of the courts. Is that intellect? Is that reason? Is that really examining a life? You see, the moment you examine it, you find it to be quite a hollow claim. People who talk like that are fooling themselves. The trouble is they don't think. They are the people who are taking the opiates, the drinks, and the various other soporifics in order to avoid thought. The Bible, I say, appeals to men to think, to think again, and to go on thinking again. It's a book that is full of warnings. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, says John the Baptist. Our Lord was always warning people. Look at his picture of the men building a house each. One on the rock, one on the sand. Be careful, he says. Take time. Floods are coming. Tempests are going to take place. Be careful. Think. Always the same. It's a book of warnings. There's no book on earth that has so many warnings to us as this book that is open here before me. And think of the way it puts it in terms of questions. Our Lord was always putting questions to people, conundrums if you like. Think, he says. How think you? Certain men are two sons and so on. 
What shall it profit a man, though he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Thought, think, work it out, balance it, assess it. Make a computation. Now this is typical, you see, of the Bible and its teaching everywhere. It's a book that calls upon men to face things and to indulge in an audit. But the sinner, the unbeliever, is the man who refuses to do these things. And he objects to being called upon to do. Let me show you what I mean. The Bible is a book that tells us, for instance, to number our days. Look at it in Psalm 90. Teach us so to number our days that we may, may apply our hearts unto wisdom. There it is, typical of the Bible. Number your days. The Bible's always telling us to do that. Consider your latter end. Don't go on living from hand to mouth, from day to day, says the Bible. Sit down, wait for a moment, number your days, count them. Because you see, every day you live, you've got one less to live. Well, that's the Bible. Do you like that sort of teaching? The world hates it. Why should we be reminded of death, says the Bible? In other words, it will not number its days. It won't count them. And yet it's obviously the essence of wisdom that we should do so. Another thing it never does is this. It never really and truly examines and assesses the value of the things that it's got. It assumes they're of value as Paul did. It won't really stop and examine them and look at them. It doesn't say, well now then, take this so-called good time. What is the real value of the good time? What does it really give me? What have I got after I've done it all? It doesn't stop and ask that question. If it did, it wouldn't go on with it. But you see, it doesn't stop to do it. Because it would soon find loss of character, loss of chastity, loss of purity, loss of everything that is most valuable, most delicate, most sensitive. But it doesn't do that. And in another way, I can put it like this, that this man always refuses to face all the factors that bear upon a man's life in this world, all of them. You see, the trouble is it's selective. It just picks out what it wants and what it likes. But there are other factors, and it will not consider them. It's very interested in the seen, in the visible, in the material, money, and things money can buy all tremendously interested. Ah, uh, but what about the unseen factors? What about the unseen things? What about the soul? What about the spiritual realm? What about God? No, no, it doesn't consider them. Now, you see, that's why the balance sheet is dishonest. You leave anything out, you leave any factors out, it's no longer a straight and an open and an honest balance sheet. And this is the trouble with this man. He never really faces the facts. Why doesn't he do so? I'm analyzing this, my friend, in order that you may really face and examine yourself and be delivered from self-deception. Why is it that this man refuses to face the facts? Well, there are many answers to this again. One is uh, the whole temperament and outlook and attitude of this unbeliever. The unbeliever is always foolhardy. He's always self-confident by nature. He's the sort of man who says, everything's all right. What are you bothering about? He always buys himself up and works up a case to please himself. Now, I could very easily illustrate that point by taking you right through the Bible. You see, that's what the Bible tells us about the generation before the flood. Here's a man called Noah building an ark. They say, what are you doing? He says, a great flood's coming. What are you talking about, they said. Rubbish, nonsense. I tell you, God has told me, a flood is coming. There is to be a judgment of this world. So he goes on, year after year, building his ark. And they roared at him. They laughed at him. They ridiculed him. What are you talking about, they said. Look, yeah, you said that a hundred years ago, you know, and you're still saying it, and you're still going on building your ark. But where's your flood? Everything's all right. But the flood came suddenly, unexpectedly and carried them all away. It was exactly the same before Sodom and Gomorrah. That righteous man Lot was vexing his righteous soul as he could see what was happening. 
What are you bothering about? They said, who's this stranger who's coming here to tell us how we are to live? Everything's all right. On they went with their sodomy and all their foul sins and perversions and everything that's so defacing the life of this country today. It's all right, they said. And they went on saying it until their cities were destroyed. The children of Israel, God's own people, were exactly the same. They rebelled against God. They said, we are not going to be tied down like this. We know how to live. God sent them prophets, and they stoned them. They threw them into prison. They threw them down into the depths of wells like Jeremiah, and so on. They went to listen to them. These prophets said, look here, if you don't repent and come back to God, you're going to be carried away. There's going to be disaster. An enemy is going to come and ruin your city and your land. You'll be carried away as captives. And they ridiculed them, laughed them. Why, they said, everything's all right. Peace, peace. When there is no peace, exactly as we were in this country before the last war, and regarded the one man who saw it coming as a militarist and a warmonger and an impossible man to work with. You see, mankind's always done this. He didn't even listen to the Son of God when he was in this world. He warned his own nation, the Jews, that if they didn't repent and believe his message, that again their city was going to be destroyed by the Roman army, and that they'd be scattered amongst the nations of the world, and they crucified him for saying it, and they ridiculed him. Everything was all right. But it happened in A.D. 70. That's always the mentality of this unbeliever. Everything's all right. He's saying it now. With all the terrible possibilities in this world, he still carries on. Have a good time. Let's enjoy ourselves. Everything's all right. Is it? You see, that's a fatal mentality. That's the way to fool yourself, to deceive yourself. And it's because he's like that he will not make an audit. He will not examine the facts truly. Another explanation is, of course, his love of ease. You see, this demands effort, doesn't it? It demands an effort to listen to a sermon, my friend. You see, I'm not here to tell stories. I'm here to ask you to think. I'm putting facts before you. This isn't entertainment, is it? This demands effort. And modern man doesn't like making effort. Look at his newspapers. Everything reduced to tabloids. Everything a little bit on a screen. People don't read as they used to. Effort? We don't want to, we want to sit back. We don't play games even. We watch other people playing games. Effort? laziness, this fatal paralysis that comes across men. He dislikes effort. But of course, a further and a profounder reason for his refusal to make an honest audit is this. But when he does so, it makes him feel uncomfortable and unhappy. Postman comes and presents you with a bill. And you know what's inside, but you don't want to know, do you? You lose it conveniently. And as long as you forget about it, everything's all right, but the bill has come, and there it is. But we don't like bills. They call us to do something. They present themselves, and we've got to settle them. We don't like that. We don't like anything that disturbs us, anything that makes us feel unhappy. No, no, keep it from us, we say. That's why we don't like thinking of death and old age and so on. We're all being young until we're a hundred or something. No, no, you see, it's an uncomfortable thought, this. Thoughts of that unknown bomb from which no traveler returns. That's the trouble. That's the rub. It always has been. It still is. It always will be. The trouble is that all this examination makes us feel unhappy, miserable, and we want to get away from it, so we rush out to some pleasure to forget the fact. But you see, at the back of all this is the influence of the devil. That's why we don't indulge in an honest audit. The devil sees to it that we don't. He knows that the moment a man stops and begins to think and to count and to make his audit, that man's going to be disturbed. He's going to be awakened. That man's in grave danger of becoming a Christian. So the devil sees to it that he doesn't do it. How does he do that? Well, he does it by organizing the world as he's organizing it today. One of the most difficult things in this world tonight is to think. You see, your newspapers deliver to you before breakfast. So you don't have time to examine yourself, you're reading the news. And the world keeps you occupied, you go and do your work, people talk to you. And then you see all the pleasures, all the entertainment, 
Everything put on the plate before us, everything supplied, and we don't think. That's all the devil, there's no question about it at all. The extremely difficult thing in the world today is just to sit down and think and ask yourself certain questions. When I consider how my life is spent and half my days in this dark world and wide, do we sit down and ask that question? No, no, the world keeps us so busy and the world is governed by the God of this world, the devil, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience and the result is that he keeps us so occupied that we never stop and make an assessment. I'm not imagining these things, am I? Isn't this, don't you find this to be the great battle of life? Don't you find the days and the weeks and the months and the years slipping past and you haven't done things you thought of doing and you don't know where you are, you're being carried along by a tide. How difficult it is to stop and think and count. The devil. But I'll give you my final reason. The ultimate reason why this unbeliever doesn't indulge in this honest audit and balance is this. That he doesn't know. He doesn't know of, he doesn't believe in a final compulsory audit. That's his trouble. He doesn't know, he doesn't realize that an account is being kept and that the day will come when he's got to face it. You read in your papers, we all read them, don't we, about these men. Suddenly you find they've been on in the old bailey. And then the facts come out how this man has been living this fraudulent life for a number of years. Well, how did he manage it? Well, you see, he was able to balance things. He was able to arrange the balance sheet and the account, leave out this, put in that. And up to a point it worked quite all right and it seemed everything all right. But what, how did he get caught eventually? Well, that's always the trouble, doesn't it? The Inland Revenue people have got their accounts also. And they're watching. This man forgets all about them. He goes on. He's very clever. He's enjoying the proceeds. Ah, uh, but they're watching. And they say, well, no, we don't quite understand this. They've got their accounts. They can't quite square this. If this man's account is true, well, then how does he do that? How did he buy this property? Where did he get the money from? We haven't seen any account. They're keeping an account. And so the day of reckoning comes. Suddenly they land on him and they produce their books and he's got to explain and he can't. And that's the position of every one of us in this world. We are not the only ones keeping ledgers and books and accounts. All things are naked and open unto the eye of him with whom we have to do. The sinner doesn't know that. He doesn't realize it. He thinks this is the only life, the only world. He doesn't believe in God. He doesn't believe in judgment. He doesn't believe in hell. That's his trouble. It's just this life, this world, and when you die, that's the end. It doesn't. But it's because he fools himself with it that he thus is guilty of this fatal self-deception. There, then, is our first proposition. That the unbeliever, this man who doesn't believe in God and who doesn't live the godly life, he never makes an honest audit. He makes a false audit and he produces a false balance sheet. Very well, let me come to the second principle, which is this one. How does one make a true audit? Surely that's the thing we all ought to know now. How does one make a true audit that will stand up to the test of the last auditor when he comes in from the courts of heaven to look at our books? Now, the sinner, I say, not only doesn't keep a proper audit, he can't do so. Why can't he? Well, you see, you can't make an audit unless you're taught how to do it. You must know how to do it. And this poor man, this man who doesn't believe in God and in Christ, he hasn't got uh, a standard of values. He hasn't got a method of conducting an audit. 
You see, you can't do these things unless you can refer to some standard always. You must, everything's got to be estimated in terms of a standard. That's how you measure anything. There's a standard yard measure. That's how you weigh everything. There's a standard measure. Everything's got to be judged according to standards. You can't begin to count and to assess unless you've got a standard. You must have a standard and you must also have a correct method. Now, the unbeliever lacks both. What is his standard? Uh, Paul says, what things were gained to me? Well, he'd been keeping accounts. He thought he'd got a standard. But what was his standard? Well, you see, his standard was his own opinion. In the 26th chapter of Acts, you'll find him addressing Agrippa and Festus. And he says, I verily thought with myself. Exactly. That's what every man does who's not a Christian. He thinks with himself. So people today, they estimate life and they estimate their living in this world in terms of what they think. This is what I say. They say, this is what I think. And because if they say it, well, it's right. Well, then others agree with them. But who are they? Well, they're people in exactly the same position. They're unbelievers also. So their only standard is what they think, what they say, what the papers say, what people say. That's the standard. And the other element in the standard, of course, is this, pleasure. This is the ultimate test of everybody today. Does this give me pleasure? Does this give me happiness? That's what they want, you see. They don't think of the future consequences. Does it give me pleasure now? Does it give me immediate satisfaction? That's why so many are in trouble. They don't think ahead. Just the moment, the fleeting moment, the bubble. It's here, it's gone. It's beautiful, it's iridescent, it's charming. Must have it. And they don't think... They don't look ahead, they don't think of consequences. The standard is immediate pleasure, immediate happiness for the time being only. And because there are their two standards, they live as they do. Now it's patent, as I'm going to show you, that a man who's got such a standard is incapable of making a true audit. He can't, he can't help himself. And then his method is equally bad. What is the method of this man? Well, his method is this, you see that he's determined before he starts his audit that everything's going to be all right. He's prejudiced in favor of himself. He isn't making an honest audit. He wants to be happy. He wants to enjoy himself. So he starts out with a number of rules and regulations which are going to put everything all right for him. And he so handles his account, it always comes out right. Now, the psychologists have got an interesting term to describe that. They call that rationalizing our sins, explaining everything away satisfactorily. You see, somebody comes and says, but now look here, what about that? You shouldn't have done that. Oh, well, and then we begin to explain it. If we were told of somebody else who'd done that, we'd denounce them violently, like King David did. You remember they put a question to him, they put a conundrum to him, and David gave a righteous indignation answer. And then said Nathan to him, thou art the man. You've been doing in your life exactly what the person did in the story I've just told you. And poor David collapsed. But you see, we can explain what we do always, can't we? And that's why we are incapable of making an honest balance sheet as we are by nature. We haven't got a standard. Our whole method is wrong. And the result is a false balance sheet. Very well, then, what is the true way? The apostle tells us in this one verse, What things were gained to me, those I discovered to be lost. I counted lost. When? How? For Christ. Now then, the true way to make a correct balance sheet is this. You've got to have a standard and you've got to have a method. You've got to, you have got to be instructed before you can be an auditor. You can't just say, I set myself up as an auditor. No, no. You need instruction. There's a way of doing this. Standard methods. Let me tell you what they are. What's the standard? What I think, who am I? pygmy little creature as I am, passing through this world of time. What do I know? I don't understand myself. I don't understand this atomic power. I don't understand life. I don't understand death. No, no. I must have something bigger, something greater. What is it? Here it is, my friend. Here's the textbook. Here's the way to be taught how to make an audit of life. The Bible. What's this? God's Word. Here is the ultimate auditor telling us how to conduct an audit. Here's the last word. The ultimate authority. God himself telling us how to do it. And especially as the apostle reminds us here, in terms of the Lord Jesus Christ, what things were gained to me, them I counted loss. For Christ, 
Here's a standard. I've got to judge everything in my life, individually, outside me, relationships with others. Everything's got to be brought to this one standard. The Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the Son of God, but he's been in this world. What was he doing here? What about his teaching? Why did he die on the cross? Why did he have to? He said he had to. Why did he? He rose again. What's all this mean to me? Now, you see, that's the way to make your audit. You don't make your audit by just saying, am I happy? Am I going to continue to be happy? No, no. You start by saying, here is this great fact of the Son of God in this world is dying, is resurrection. What's it mean? What's its relevance to me? Where am I in this? What's he got to say to me? I must examine myself in the light of this. Do I believe in him? Have I got any connection with him? What is this to me? You see, that's how you start making your audit. There's your standard. Then you come to your methods in detail. What are these? Well, here are the points. The first thing is this. I've got to be honest. Thou requirest truth in the inward parts. All things are naked and open unto the eye of him with whom we have to do. If I regard or nestle or conceal iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You've got to be honest here, my friend. You can't fool God. You might as well not start upon your audit unless you decide. You've got to be scrupulously honest. You're not going to conceal anything because you can't, you see. It's ridiculous. Everything's known, so therefore give it up. Be honest. The next thing is you've got to be thorough. If an auditor is slipshod in his methods, he's a bad and a dangerous auditor. He'll be struck off the rolls. He deserves to be. He should be prosecuted. It's no use standing up in court and saying, I was in such a hurry, I missed that item. The business of an auditor is to examine every single item. Does this tally with the bank book? It must. Nothing is to be taken for granted. Every single detail has got to be gone through with a tooth comb. And when you and I come to make an audit of our lives in this world, we've got to do that. You don't slide over things. You don't say yes, but. No, no. You stop. You face it. As the Spirit of God convicts you, you stop and look at it. As the Word convicts you, as you read it, you say, well, what about it? You've got to examine every single detail and item absolutely honestly and with utter thoroughness. What else? Well, but to make this proper audit, you've got to consider all the factors. Everything that bears upon your life and upon this business of life that you are conducting, competitors, Possibly, eventually, you must consider them all. They've got to be brought in. And then you've got to look at this balance of yours. You've got to be making additions and you've got to say, where have I arrived now? What's my moral credit? What's my moral balance? I've lived in this world so long. Have I got all the purity I started with? Have I got all the chastity? Have I got all the honesty? Am I as trustworthy as I was? What am I doing with what I started off with, the capital which was given to me when my father sent me out? What of it? Where is it? Where are my assets? And what am I making out of the things to which I give my time and my attention and most of my energy? Where are they? Where do they appear? What are they yielding to me? You've got to be honest with this balance. And then you've got to consider future prospects, haven't you? What's likely to happen? Are there not certain eventualities? Businesses today are having to consider the possibility of entering the common market. How's that going to affect the business? Quite right. If you want to make money, you've got to think of things like that. But so as a man in life, what may happen to me during this next 12 months? What may happen to me in the next 10 years? What may happen to me beyond? It's got to come in. You've got to be ready for it. You've got to be using your assets in a way that you're preparing. Is there a reserve? Is there something that you can call upon if you happen to have a bad year? And so, in other words, if illness comes, if you're struck down by an accident in the street, if death visits your family, all these, you've got to consider them every one and prepare for them. Get your reserves into position. In other words, everything that may conceivably affect the business has got to be brought into consideration and to be faced honestly. Now then, my friends, that's the way to conduct an audit. Standard methods. Very well, that brings me to my last word, which is this. What is the result of conducting such a true audit? 
That's the question. What does a man find when he conducts an audit after the instructions of the Almighty God? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in this dramatic word what happened to him. Once he met the Lord Jesus Christ, he made his audit. And what did he find? Startling discovery. Complete reversal of everything he'd ever thought. His balance sheet was false. What he thought was gained was lost. He's got nothing. He who thought he was so wealthy. His ledgers are all wrong. And he's got to make a complete and entire new start. How did he find that? Well, he found it, as he tells us, by beginning to count by beginning to do things in the right way. Now let me show you how it worked out. Look at these things of which he boasted. He says, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I'm all. He opens his ledger. What is it? Circumcised the eighth day. That puts me right. I've been circumcised. I'm a Jew. Therefore I'm all right. But now, in the light of the new standard, he looks at it again. And this is what he finds. This circumcision of mine is only in the flesh. But that's only a picture. What God wants is a circumcision of the heart. And he found his heart wasn't circumcised. He was satisfied with something in the flesh. And the heart was black. It was dark. It was vile. It was wrong. Immediately he found that that asset must be written off. There's nothing there. What next? Well, he goes on to say, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. Wonderful. This is the thing that puts a man right with God. This is the thing that makes a man complacent and makes him say that he has nothing to worry about. It's there as a tremendous asset. A Jew, an Israelite, an Hebrew, of the Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin. My birth, my origins. Wonderful. The fact that I'm a Jew puts me right. But then the new standard and the honesty involved. What did he find? Oh, he tells us this, you know, in the first three chapters of his great epistle to the Romans. What he found was this. That there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. He thought there was. He found there wasn't. He found that face to face with the law of God, that the Jew was as much under condemnation as the Gentile. There is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He can't rely upon the fact that he's a Jew. Off goes the second asset. There's nothing there. Being a Jew doesn't help him at all. The Jew is as damned as the Gentile, by nature. What else? Well, the next thing you notice he puts before us is this one. As touching the law, a Pharisee. What do you mean? Well, he means this. As regards knowledge of the law, a scholar, a man who knows all about it, an expert, student of the Malian, favorite, top of the list, a Pharisee and a Pharisee of the Pharisees, his knowledge of the law, marvelous, put it down, what an asset, what a gain. But then the new standard, what did he find? Well, he found that the knowledge of the law couldn't save anybody. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The fact that the Jews have the law and that they know it doesn't make any difference. It's not he that knows the law, it's he that practices it that is saved by it. The mere knowledge of the law is of no value unless you put it into practice. And he hadn't. Off goes that asset. There's nothing there. His old account is beginning to look rather differently. My main items, they're going out. One after another got to be erased. There's nothing there that I can lean on. Let me come to the next, therefore. What's the next thing? Well, concerning zeal. Persecuting the church and doing so more than anybody else. This must be right. But then the new standard. This is how he puts it when he talks about the Jews later. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. It's no good. 
You can be very zealous, but if it isn't according to knowledge, it's of no value. What he found was this, that all this tremendous zeal of his, which he thought was pleasing God, was fighting against God. He was blaspheming God's Son. He was trying to blaspheme the name of the Savior of the world. It was blasphemy. His zeal was blasphemy. Off it goes. There's nothing there. And that brings us to the last item. Surely this must be right. Touching the righteousness which is in the law. Blameless. Well, this must be right. He knew the law and he'd been practicing the law. But the new standard comes. What did he find? Well, he found, you see, that he had never understood the law at all. He, like all the Pharisees, had abstracted certain things only and had left the rest. They hadn't understood the spiritual character of the law. They said as long as a man's not actually committed adultery, he's all right. No, no, says Christ. If a man looks at a woman to commit adultery, he's done it already in his heart. A thought is as damnable as a deed here. The law is spiritual. So what did he find? Well, he found that what he'd regarded as blameless was nothing but what he calls later, mine own righteousness. He found he was a vile sinner, so in writing to Timothy, he calls himself the chief of sinners. It is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. The man who said he was blameless is the chief of sinners. Off it goes. There's nothing there. My assets have disappeared as the morning mist. I've got nothing left. What things were gained to me. I counted, I had to admit, I had to confess, I had to give up and give in. It's nothing but loss. Christ has shown me that there's no value in anything at all. His ledgers are useless. They must be burnt and ruined and destroyed. He's got nothing at all. He's absolutely helpless. He's conducted his audit and he finds he's penniless. He's a pauper. He's hopeless. He's lost. He's damned. What can he do? Thank God. When you meet the heavenly auditor, he doesn't stop at exposing the dishonesty and the chicanery and the self-deception of our supposed ledgers and balance sheets. He does that first, you know. He always does that. If you are not convicted of sin, you are not a Christian. I don't care whether you say you believe in Christ or not. If you haven't seen your utter helplessness and penury, your hopelessness, your loss, you've never met him. You don't know him. The first thing he always does is to destroy our books and to show their utter deceitfulness and wrongfulness and final uselessness. But then, blessed be his name, he looks at us and he says, you're penniless. You've got nothing. You're the chief of sinners. But I came into the world for people like you. Do you really acknowledge it? Are you still trying to cook the accounts? Are you still trying to say, but wait a minute, what about this? Are you still, if you are, I've got nothing to say to you. I just let you stew in your own accounts. Get on with it. Try and put something, if you can, on the credit side. Go on, if you think you can. Try and put something there. And my friend, I, in his name, as a little, little accountant, a mere little office boy in this great business of auditing, I'll get it off your ledger for you very simply. You try and put anything on that side. I'll erase it for you. But the moment you honestly admit that there's nothing there, the moment you say, I am indeed the chief of sinners, I've got nothing, I've been a fool. I've been living in a fool's paradise, I've been deceiving myself, I've been misleading myself, I've been buying myself upon nothing, I've got nothing, I don't know where I am, I'm helpless, I'm lost. The moment you say that to him, he'll say, listen, I'll give you a new book. I'll give you a fresh start. I'll put a sum of money in the bank for you. I'll give you capital. You say, how much do I pay you for that? He says, you've got nothing to pay with what you're talking about. I give it to you for nothing. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Believe in me, he says. 
I can give you a balance. I can give you capital. I purchased it with my own life. I was crucified on a tree. My body was broken. My blood was shed. What for? In order to give you a new start. I've paid your accounts. I've cleared your books. I've put your right with my father, the hymn, the auditor. And you can have a new start. You can start living a new life. And I won't leave you to run it yourself. I'll be with you. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm with you in the business. It's going to be a partnership. And you'll go on from success to success. You'll be changed from glory into glory till in heaven you take your place. Till you cast your crown before him, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Have you done the audit? Have you met him? Have you heard what he says? Oh, let me put it to you. In the words of the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. What are these? Oh, these are the ledgers of heaven. The heavenly Somerset House. The heavenly Inland Revenue. The books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. You see, everything that you and I do is known and seen of God and is recorded of God. Ah, oh, you say you're keeping your ledgers. God's keeping his ledger. The books are there. Everything's recorded. They were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh, my dear friend. You know, I wouldn't be preaching at all if this wasn't true. Be wise. Make your audit now. Make it in terms of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Be honest, be thorough, admit it all, confess it. See what a fool you've been. And receive his gracious, his wonderful offer of free salvation. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.